Economies operate in cycles. They go through booms and busts, expansions and recessions. Therefore, crises should not come as a surprise. While most believe that expansionary monetary policy helps ease crises, the Austrian school begs to differ. Austrian school economists argue that central banks don't help in smoothing the amplitude of the cycles, but rather are the cause of the cycles. In this micro-documentary, we look back at four major busts in the last 100 years and explain how central banks created them. We also clarify why we believe the next bust is just around the corner. This video will not explain the mainstream view, but rather the view of the Austrian business cycle theory, or ABCT. Austrian economists argue that business cycles are a direct cause of excessive credit flow into the market. This is facilitated by an intentionally low interest rate set by the government. This situation gives the false impression that money originally saved for investment has increased and the pool of investable funds is bigger. This creates an illusion and leads to misallocation of investments or malinvestments. What happens when the central bank artificially lowers the interest rate? It sends mixed signals to market participants. On the one hand, entrepreneurs invest more and increase the depth of the production process. On the other hand, consumers spend more as saving is unattractive. When the excess products created through the cheap money-induced investments reach the market, consumers are unable to buy them. At this point, the bust occurs. By manipulating interest rates, governments create bubbles. Austrian business cycle theory argues that credit inflation is a distortion of what is actually available to support current production and consumption levels. That is why a correction is inevitable. Austrian economist Mises warned that the longer malinvestments continue, the more aggressive the correction becomes. A recession arrives when the economy readjusts as consumers come to re-establish their desired allocation of saving at prevailing interest rates. That is when consumers decide to save more and consume less. In such a market correction, everything goes down. It is a reversal of the inflationary pickup during the boom. According to Mises, there is no way to fix this except by going through the correction. Now, let's examine four major busts from an Austrian business cycle theory point of view. Case 1. The Great Depression Austrian economist Rothbard argues that the Great Depression was caused by too much government interference. Since World War I, the U.S. insisted on extending economic growth through monetary expansion. Between 1921 and 1929, money supply surged 63%. This spike in inflation was not in circulated currency, but rather in bank deposits and other monetary instruments that caused the expansion of the credit base of commercial banks. More so, the U.S. Fed gave banks the green light to finance stock investors. The stock market boomed, and speculation was on the rise to the extent that it did not reflect the realities of a depression until months after money supply growth figures slowed down. The monetary inflation was completed by the end of 1928. The correction followed soon thereafter. Rothbard explains that the American government should have either adopted a laissez-faire style of economic management to allow the market to correct itself or introduce tighter monetary policy measures. 
Instead, the government made the situation worse by implementing President Hoover's New Deal program, which led to more cash injections into the economy. Generous government spending caused wages and prices to go up and supported weak firms. Does that sound familiar? Case 2. The Recession of 1990. The recession of the 90s is another example of an expansionary monetary policy. Between 1981 and 1986, the Fed increased the money supply by an average of 9.6% per year, while real GNP rose by only 2.6%. After 1986, the Fed toned down its strategy as money supply increased by 4.1% per year. Meanwhile, GNP remained stable around 2%. Although money supply expansion and the boom of the higher order industries, particularly iron and steel, ended in 1986, the recession was not really felt until four years later. The outcome of the Fed's strategy was a significant increase of bank loans, particularly to higher level industry sectors. Lower level industries, mainly manufacturing facilities of consumer goods, were initially unaffected. It was not until 1986 when borrowings to lower stage industries started to pick up. How so, particularly after the Fed limited its credit expansion? The dramatic reduction in money supply increases in 1987 did not affect the total borrowing level at all. In fact, the average annual increase in borrowing after 1986 was higher than before. What did change was the distribution of borrowings. Before 1986, most of the increase was led by higher stage industrial borrowers, represented by iron and steel. After 1986, the increase in total borrowings was fueled by lower stage industries, represented by food. These loans by early stage industries were directed into capital spending and resulted in a larger labor force and salary increases, which drove an overall expansion in consumer demand. More consumer spending drove retailers and manufacturers to take loans to expand their businesses. It was not a matter of interest rate level, but a reaction to consumer spending. But why did the Fed drastically turn away from its credit expansion strategy? According to economist Arthur Middleton Hughes, consumer prices shot up on higher medical expenses due to Medicare and Medicaid. The turning point was 1987, when the Fed put the brakes on money supply increases and maintained this policy for five years. The aftermath of the credit expansion was a steady, yet inevitable, recession. Case 3. The Dot-Com Boom and Bust The dot-com cycle started in 1995. The U.S. economy experienced an inflationary and unsustainable boom generated by a politically motivated expansionary policy. Meanwhile, there was a structural change in the economy caused by the Internet and IT. The market was euphoric and encouraged a great amount of capital flow into the sector. Investments into the IT sector were largely driven by the hope of a profitable future instead of solid business plans. The structural change in the economy further translated into higher prices across the sector for machinery, salaries, etc. Even though the economy at the time was considered to be at full employment, the Fed continued its strategy of lowering interest rates. Meanwhile, the U.S. faced a series of financial crises in Asia, Russia, Brazil, and within the U.S. It drove the Fed to further increase market liquidity. The outcome was an overheated economy as more money made its way to dot-com startups. It was too much, too fast. The Fed finally became concerned about the overheating of the economy and reversed its monetary easing. But it was too late. By early 2000, consumers had spent too much on the heightened expectations of the IT sector. The artificial boom inevitably collapsed. Case 4. 
The Global Financial Crisis The foundation for the global financial crisis was set right after the recovery from the dot-com bust. The chart shows the relationship between the U.S. 10-year interest rate and the federal fund effective rates. It also shows, in gray, the times of contraction during the period between July 1954 and May 2010. It is clear that since the 80s, the Fed lowered interest rates below the natural levels. It also maintained them at these lower levels versus the natural rate in times of economic slowdown in 1990, 2000, and after 2008. After 2000, the low interest rates fueled a boom. The rates were only briefly above the natural interest rate, so everything became more affordable and inflation picked up. Growth in economic productivity between 2002 and 2007 was the prelude to the crisis. But again, it was far from sustainable. The growth was largely facilitated by a very accommodative monetary policy in parallel with a surge in real estate. Home ownership rates surged up to 2007 as a result of aggressive mortgage lending not only by offering low rates, but also by accepting poor credit history. These loans were repackaged and resold in the form of derivatives and financial instruments, creating the housing bubble. The Fed prolonged the phase of accommodative policy too long, when in fact it should have tightened. Such a tightened policy would not have extended the boom and would also have softened the hit after the boom was over. Where are we in the current cycle? Today's policy is considered the largest monetary easing in history. We cannot pinpoint our position in the cycle, but we believe that if it weren't for state intervention in 2007-2008, the correction would have been hard but short. Bailouts, quantitative easing, stimulus programs, the names differ, but all offer the same temporary fix by injecting more cash into the system. We believe we are quite advanced in this cycle. The chart shows three lines. The straight line indicates GDP growth over time if there were no credit-induced growth. The other two lines show the short-term and long-term business cycles. We believe that the recessions discussed in this video all fall into the category of short-term cycles. We also believe that we have been in a booming phase in the long-term economic cycle since 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window. But we are reaching the boom phase of this long-term cycle, meaning we are approaching a devastating bust. Pinpointing the tipping point is impossible. This cycle can easily continue for some years. Looking at where we stand in the short-term cycle, we think that we are approaching a top as well, possibly not the last one before the devastating bust. In a bust scenario, people flee down the pyramid to their safe haven, being gold. When this bust occurs, we consider physical gold stored outside the banking system, a precious counterbalance to other asset classes. Holding a scarce asset with absolutely no counterparty risk affords investors a hedge against a crisis. It offers a much needed safety net when the banking system and all that it is based on fails. Are you prepared?